Hello. I'm going to be talking about question three in the September-December exam, question called STEM. If you need to, pause the recording before each part so you can have a look at the words and the numbers. Do your own plan again um, just before you um, make a start on the listening to the debrief. Now, question was largely in two parts. The first part was about leasing and relating issues. The second part, completely unrelated, was about things like associates and joint ventures. So, in the first requirement, which was for 13 marks, I thought it was very, very time pressured. They wanted to know the impact on of certain transactions on EBITDA, profit before tax, and also on the balance sheet. What's in the balance sheet? Well, assets and liabilities. The transactions themselves were very, very straightforward. Um, if you'd been using the spreadsheet, I guess the numbers weren't too bad. Um, and it was very much a test of basic accounting. I don't think I've seen a question with so many calculations at this level for a number of years. But the examiner thought people would be quite pleased about that. In fact, they hated it. But we'll see as we go through. So they're looking at uh, buying some assets. There are three options. The first option is that they actually go down the route of having a four-year lease. And as you know, if they have a, a, a long-term lease, more than a year, they need to capitalise a right-of-use asset. They need to set up a lease liability. We're looking at the books of the lessee. So whatever happens, don't mention the word finance lease. That's something to do with lessor accounting with the lessee. But the message is, isn't it, the four-year lease needs to be capitalised in the balance sheet. Just really as a bit of a revision, I'll kind of work through this with you, just thinking about what happens in practice, how the accounts look, before we hit more towards focusing in the specific requirement. But if you're looking at this, one way to visualise it is just to think about what's happening at the start of the year on the 1st of Jan and also at the end of the year on the 31st of December. We're only being asked about the end of the year, I know. So in the soft P, if they go down the leasing routes, the, the long-term lease route, they'll be recognising again a right of use asset which would be part of non-current assets and a lease liability. No calculations. It tells us that the actual present value of the lease payments is 50803. So no calculations needed. By the time you get to the end of the year, of course, you've got the profit and loss. In the profit and loss, you would normally expect to see depreciation and a finance cost. In addition, though, these are um, cars. There's also a service cost when it goes to the garage to check the tyres and whatever else you check with a car. I'm not really sure, but there's some kind of service charge. So by the end of the year, those things are knocking in. The asset will be depreciated. It's a four-year lease. So the depreciation, one-fourth of 5803, which I think is 12701. The service charge was given. It's 235 for 12 months. 
So 12 lots of 235. 12 lots of 235 would be 2820. The finance cost, I think, was given. It says the interest has been correctly calculated, so don't start making trouble. 2274. In terms of the balance sheet, the right of use asset will have been depreciated. So that's 5803 minus uh, 12701. So that would give you 38102. You need to do a little amortized cost working for the liability. I'm just going to try and squeeze mine in here. So on the liability side, the brought down liability at the start of the year was 5803. We know that the finance cost we've just worked out was, well, copied 2274. The only messy bit is the cash. As far as the cash payments go, In the scenario, we're told that we make 12 payments of 1403, which include the service charge. So 12 times 1403 minus 235. Just put that arrow up here instead. There we are. That's better. So that would give me cash paid, I think, of 14016. Looks a bit untidy, sorry. So that's 39061. And there we have regular accounting for a regular four year lease. A little bit of bookkeeping, though, because you had to strip the service charge out of the cash payments but really the exam before last we could have sorted that out so just keep your basic bookkeeping practice there again no need to worry about debits or credits if they phase you out option two now is a bit easier because they're just going to have a bank loan so we're going down now to think about option two And that's the bank loan. I'll use the same format for now. So 1st of Jan, 31st of December. Soft P first. This time, I wouldn't call it a right of use asset. I'd call it PPE because it's my asset and then a bank loan liability. In the scenario, it would cost me 75274, and the bank loan would be 75274. In the P&L, there's going to be depreciation, and then later finance cost. Uh, and also, of course, the service cost. Mustn't forget that in a minute. Now, depreciation first. Back to your very basics. So, remember residual value. 75274 minus residual value at the end of the life, which is um, 29753. Again, all over four. So that would give me depreciation of, I think, 11,380. So 
we mustn't get things like residual value wrong because that's again back to your basics of bookkeeping so on the carrying amount of the asset therefore it's gone down hasn't it 75274 minus the first year's depreciation of 11380 that must be 63894 if i make a transposition error don't worry about that for the moment i think we're okay so far service cost as before going through same as last time 12 lots of 235 so that would be my 2820 and finally the finance cost I don't think we need to set up a big amortized cost working it's one year it's five percent so I can just put five percent on the liability can't I five percent of seven five two seven four would give me three seven six four no payments are made at this point in time the first payment is on the first day of the following year so the closing liability would be 75274 plus 3764 so that would give you i think a closing liability of 79 i think that's 79 038 so that's option two option three is they take advantage of the optional lease exemption that where you have a lease of 12 months or less you don't have to capitalize it you can just expense it in the profit and loss so option three has to be the the easiest one in life Option three, there'll be nothing in the balance sheet at all, will there? So there'll be nothing on the 1st of Jan, but by the 31st of December, this is where you take advantage of the short-term lease exemption. And the short-term lease exemption, again, means that all you will see is in the profit and loss your rent expense and your rent expense will be 12 lots of 1900 I think they're paying twelve lots of nineteen hundred which I think is 22.8. Now, that was just to revise the accounting with you. If you handed that in like that, they would have to give you a fair bit of credit. But we haven't really answered the question as it stands, has it yet? I mean, I suppose we have shown the balance sheet impact. Um, but again, you need to kind of just show more specifically how profit will change with each of them. So we do need a little bit of a summary table just saying, well, here are the three options. Let's just see what the impact is on the balance sheet and so on. So I'm writing option one, option two, option three. balance sheet first we've got assets and liabilities I will just bring the figures forward from earlier in my answer so option one you had assets of 38102 and liabilities of 39061 option two 
63894 and 79038. Gosh, yes, because they haven't made any payments yet, have they? And the last one, no impact on the option as well. A very good answer would just make the point here that if you think about things like interpretation, which is in the syllabus, of course, that when you think about things like gearing and so on, gearing will clearly be highest with option two. And option one and two will both, um, you know, basically make gearing worse. So I'm just going to say gearing is the highest with option two. I do think in the panic of the question, people wouldn't have got that far, but it's a fair point. That's the sort of thing that management would look at. When you look at ratios as well, like asset turnover, showing the impact of efficiency. Again, you might say things, You perhaps you have time to make a comment saying, well, you know, the assets are very high with option two. And if your assets are high, it means that your asset turnover is lower. Asset turnover is lower with option two. They'd be very pleased if you could make a question, a sentence like that. You then might say, well, how many other ratios do I need to know? Well, probably one more, and that's profit. So you need to be able to say which would make the best profit. But when you talk to management, they want to know about profit. They want to know about gearing. They want to know about asset turnover, efficiency of use of assets. Anything else is probably too sophisticated for the time pressure you're facing in this exam. So if you see something like that, and it says, what's the impact on the balance sheet? Making that kind of sentence would make the market extremely happy. They then want to know the impact on profit before tax and EBITDA. Probably, I would probably do profit before tax first because you'd be saying, I don't know how to do EBITDA. It's not hard actually, but um, we probably do that out of desperation. So we'll do that first. We start out with a draft profit of 100,000 in each case. Draft profit of 100,000. That's right at the bottom of the exhibit. Then we've got the various adjustments. Depreciation, 12,701 and 11,380. The service cost, 2,820. 2,820, very different questions I've seen in the past. But working in other syllabuses, I've often seen this style of question. So I think he may well return to it. And it's a way of testing interpretation of accounts. Say, well, how would the accounts change? The transactions would be fairly simple, although a bit messy. Finance costs. I think we said double two seven four, three seven six four. The point is that with the third transaction, you've got your rentals, so whopper sized rentals of 22,800. Now, you'll all have a different PBT. All he wanted to see is that you knew roughly what you were doing. So I wouldn't worry if your number isn't specifically right. So I'm putting these figures down. I think they're right. 82205, 82036, and 772. There's your PBT. Imagine, you know, once you're qualified, you work your way up, you build up your business empire. One day you become a great leader of business, and there you are at the heart of your empire, making a decision about company cars. And you're saying, whoa. If we went down option three, profits will be very bad. However, 
um, gearing would look better. It depends who you're trying to attract at that point in time, isn't it? So some shareholders would be more interested in option one and two. Um, banks would be a bit worried about option one and two. It's all swings and roundabouts. Finally, EBITDA, all you do is add back the interest and the depreciation. So I won't put that, well, I'll just start that calculation, but you can clearly do that by yourself. So adding back the finance cost, adding back the depreciation, There's nothing to add back in the right-hand column. So I think the final figures are um, 97,180. 97,180 after all that, eh? And 77,2. So in fact, if you add back those things, actually, you know, it, it, it even more greatly, significantly shows the difference between the three options. It's the old thing, isn't it, about whether you rent or buy. And if you rent, life's a sausage, as my old mum used to say. And sometimes with renting, you're often worse off. There we are. Important with that question. Take the numbers, go on, use the ACCA software and just practice again, only the basic formulae to make sure you're happy typing in and using the software to your best advantage. But there will be more questions coming a bit like that. I know, not technically very horrible, but just a bit fiddly. If you need to, pause the recording before you look at part B. In the first part of part B, we were asked for four marks and it said, don't worry about the scenario. We were asked for four marks about when you have something like an associate, is equity accounting better than fair value? A bit of a discussion. It comes back to the old chestnut, doesn't it? Of cost accounting versus valuation accounting. So we know at the moment that when you have an associate, again, the existing rule is cost plus share of post-acquisition profits. I'm just putting a pie sign for profits. The suggestion, we're now being asked to discuss a, a so-called current issue for four marks. And like all current issues, four marks is plenty, isn't it? Just so you can say, well, I can demonstrate I understand the issue, would be to use fair value. And you're back to the old chestnuts about those characteristics of financial information because fair value might be more relevant and you can explain relevance a little bit. But again, the trouble with fair value is with any company, if it's not listed, how are you supposed to get the fair value apart from a passing gypsy so with this one, again, it's easier on the left to give faithful representation. So, you know, you can get a more um, reliable measure because you know what the cost was, you know what post-acquisition profits are. So it's the old chestnut, I say, about cost versus valuation model. So I think we could have a debate about that without too much difficulty. Remember when you're revising the framework, 
Make sure you know the asset recognition rules. Not relevant to this, I know. But secondly, make sure you know the characteristics of financial information. Relevance, things like confirming what happened in the past, predicting what will happen in the future. Faithful representation, things like avoiding bias and the information is complete and it's neutral. The second part of the question was scenario driven. And this was eight marks. There were two parts to it of which I for the first part was fine. And the second part was prize winner. There will be prize winner marks in every exam. And that here, I think. But the, the bit that's easier is that it says, first of all, well, why should you account for a particular investment called emphasis, whether or not it would be a joint venture? Let's deal with that first. Whenever you talk about joint ventures, you have to go through a two-stage process. Step one is that you have to say that something will be seen as a joint arrangement And that is, if each party has the right of veto. In the scenario, it seems to say, all significant decisions require the unanimous consent of the board. So therefore, we can say, well, this seems to be a joint arrangement. Again, so they have to have unanimous board consent. Step two is then to say, well, am I investing directly in an asset like a calculator or am I investing in a company? I'm investing in a company, aren't I? So step two is to say that a joint venture is where you are, again, investing in the shares of a company as opposed to investing in an asset like an oil pipe or something like that. So that's the case, isn't it? So that's a joint venture. So that's fine, as long as you go through the two-stage process. This is why it's a joint arrangement. And now having decided it's a joint arrangement, it's a joint venture as opposed to a joint operation. Again, some credit as well, perhaps for saying, you could perhaps say, well, it's that rather than associate. Then we've got the remaining bit, which then says to say, well, how do we account for this particular investment? So accounting. So we know it's a joint venture. So you start out with the basics, don't you? And you say, well, OK, I remember revising this. I use equity accounting. And that would normally be, wouldn't it, the cost of the investment plus the share of post-acquisition profits. Same as associates, isn't it? The reason that a distinction is made is that they used to have different rules. They don't now, fortunately. So we're OK so far, aren't we? We've said it's equity accounting. We've said that. We're now looking at the numbers. And what I know is that the cost of the investment was 150. There are no post acquisition profits at the moment. 150 plus, well, there are no post acquisition profits at the moment. Zero is 150. And then 
Later, you look at the model answer and your world falls to pieces. You burst into tears. You throw your study manual out through the window or at the pussycat. I hope you don't throw it at the pussycat. And you go, I don't understand anything because there's some prize winner point in there. And the prize winner point, which would be the last two marks, but if you didn't get them, you still get 98 in this exam. That's quite a good mark, isn't it? Is that there seems to be a difference between what you put in and the fair value of the net assets. It's very strange, isn't it? Because you've put in 100, you've put in 150. The fair value of the net assets is 470. It doesn't seem to make sense because... 40% of 470, so 40% of 470 is 188, and you're saying, well, I don't understand this, because I put 150 in, and now I've got something that's worth 188, I suppose that's all about bargaining power, but conceptually, if you put 150 in and you've now got 188, you'd be going home that night and saying, hey, I've made a really good deal here. And that's why the answer talks about it as a bargain purchase. I'm not sure I've seen this point examined in the last possibly 20 years. I might be wrong, but yes, there is a point. And if you look at a website like um, IES Plus, I think they mentioned this. Deloitte run a website called IES Plus that has accounting treatments. It's quite easy to read. And so the examiner will talk about there being a bargain purchase. And therefore, he will, um, he comes out with a calculation, which I think is like this. So, you know, things like this, if you're planning to sit this exam in the year 2044, so you're going to take a long time, it might come up again. If not, I don't think I, I would throw too many toys out of the pram. But he says cost 150. And then it's, it's almost, it's kind of a bit like goodwill, sort of, but... So, bargain purchase, 38, 188, again, this 188 here, the easiest way to visualise that is 40% of 40 Ah, uh, ba ba, four seventy. Kind of visualise that as a balancing figure. Hey, yeah, you made a bargain. You made a bargain on it. Well, it's there. I would not be losing sleep. Now, believe me, you know. Don't forget on open tuition, we have an ask the tutor facility. You can send me questions at any time. If you're sending me questions about this, I will just refer you to what I've just said. On the other hand, you know, if you turn up not being able to do this, it doesn't matter. But, but, if you turn up not being able to do this, apply residual value, that's where we're in trouble. Remember, please, as with so many of these exams, stick to the basics. Thank you for listening.